are going to start our time together uh, the same way that we do most weeks, which is in worship and in song to our God. And, you know, uh, I've come to the realization that there are a couple things that happen when we come together and worship and sing before God that uh, one may be very obvious and the other may not be so. Uh, and one is that when we come together and we sing, we sing because God is worthy of our worship, right? Carlos talked last week about extravagant worship. And so when we come together, we get the opportunity to be able to give God the praise that he's worthy of. But another thing that's happens um, that may not be so obvious is that we get to look at each other and see each other declaring these truths and these promises and these things that maybe may be hard for us to believe in a moment. So you may be walking into this room today and it may be difficult for you to believe some of the words that we sing. But to look at your brothers and your sisters in Christ next to you declaring these things, hopefully it's an encouragement and a spurring on that our God is doing what he says he will do, that he is who he says he is. And so I want to invite you to just worship with whatever you have coming in today. Worship our God, our God because he's worthy and worship our God because it encourages those around us. So let's sing together and declare the truth of John 3, 16. Here we go. Come to the will that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. We declare God so love.
days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God
what a thing to declare God's goodness over our lives, over this church, over his people. Uh, my name is Jeremy, and it is just such a joy to worship with you. I've been a friend of Parkview's for many years now, and so it's so good to be back with you worshiping, and I'm really excited to continue to sing with you, um, specifically because I am getting the opportunity to share with you a song that I actually wrote uh, with some friends of mine about a year ago. And what I love about this song is that it's taken on so many new meanings for me in this season of life with me and with our family. Uh, if you know anything about our family, uh, you'll know that we have been walking through an incredibly difficult season with the health of one of our daughters. And uh, it has been in and out of the hospital for the last year. And although it's been a really tough season, I've been able to see God's goodness in and through it. And a couple months ago, I actually decided to take her on a trip with me, uh, just kind of a daddy-daughter trip where we could get closer together and spend some time together. And we had all these things planned. We had so many activities planned. We had tickets to places, places we wanted to visit and see. And uh, one of the mornings we woke up, which was a Saturday morning, uh, she leaned over to me and said that I'm so exhausted. I'm so physically tired. I don't have the energy to do anything today but lay in this bed. And she was so guilty about it because she had leaned over and said, I'm ruining our trip. We had all these things planned. And in that moment, I felt the Holy Spirit lead me to share with her. I don't think you understand that the reason I decided to take this trip with you was so that we could just be together. It's not about what we do. It's not about where we plan to go. It's not about all the things that we had. And the realization that I have had in the weeks to come is that's exactly what our relationship with God looks like. We so often think that we have to say all the right words, we have to memorize the right scriptures, we have to pray the right prayers before God will love and accept us, and what he wants from us is intimacy. All he wants is to be with his children. And so we're gonna sing a song right now about that love, about the Father's love that he has for us. And if you've walked into this room and you maybe feel like you don't deserve to be here or you can't possibly carry in the mess of your life, let me tell you that God is our father, and in the same way that a father looks to a child, he wants to look down at you and let you know that you are deeply, deeply loved as his child, as his son and his daughter. So let's declare that this morning, the truth of the father's love. Let's sing. Describe it, the layers of your love. Words can't define it, they'll never measure up. I've searched over and over, oh, how I've tried. There's no greater love. That I could find. Oh, there's nothing like the Father's, the Father's, the Father's love for me. Oh, there's nothing like the Father's, the Father's, the Father's love for me. His love for me. over and over oh how I've tried and there's no greater love that I could find oh there's nothing like the Father's the Father's the Father's love for me oh there's nothing like the Father's the Father's love 
there's no higher love. Come on, sing with me. That there's nothing like the Father's, the Father's, the Father's love for me. Oh, there's nothing like the Father's, the Father's, the Father's love. Some of you need to hear this. That there's nothing like the Father's, the Father's, the Father's love for you. Oh, there's nothing like the Father's, the Father's, the Father's love for me. Yeah, He loves us. I'm so grateful that we get to declare that. I'm so grateful that we, we declare that you love us. No conditions. You love us when we're imperfect, when we're broken, when we don't have it all together, and you love us when everything's going great, God. There's nothing that we could do or say that will change the way that you love us. So I pray right now, God, for every heart in this room that wonders, for every heart in this room that wonders if you could possibly love a wretch like us. But we know that because of your grace, your mercy, your compassion, that not only can you love people like us, but you do love people like us. God, I pray that we would wake up to the fullness of what that loves mean, that we, can, that we can walk out in step exactly with everything that you have planned for us, that we can believe and know that we are your children. And just like a child goes to a parent for everything that they need, that we can go to you for everything that we need because we are loved. Because you love us. Oh. Thank you for that love, God. Thank you for Jesus who makes all of this possible. It's in his name that we pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated.
Well, good morning, my name is Josh, and I'm one of our pastors here, and a special welcome to teachers and all of you who work on a school staff. Uh, you are our heroes, and so it is uh, our pleasure to celebrate you this morning. Yeah, you can give them another hand, absolutely. We're gonna keep it coming. Uh, and so we have a appreciation letter that I would love to read for you on behalf of our community. Dear school teachers and school counselors and administrative staff and principals and vice principals, coaches, assistant coaches, the assistant to the assistant coach, aides, all those who prepare and serve lunches, IT people, nurses, superintendents, facilities and operations teams, anyone else on staff who makes it possible uh, and contributes to the daily education and care of our students. This is a thank you letter to you. And not just for this year, but for this season, which we know at times has felt like it's lasted a lifetime. We know that there was no pandemic training in your school degree programs. You've gone virtual and then in person and back and forth or some weird mix of both. You've masked up, you've masked optional and back and forth more times than you can count. You've lifted up our students when they've struggled to stay focused, stay connected, stay motivated and stay positive even when you have struggled with some of those things yourselves. You've stood in the gap of helping students navigate a world that has experienced its fair share of controversy in these past couple years. And on top of all that, you've had all of your normal responsibilities as a staff that require all of your wisdom, intuition, expertise, and energy. You've spent long evenings at the school. You've cleaned up well after events have finished. You've stressed over starting lineups and coaching strategies. You've prepared lessons well into the night when you're supposed to be off the clock. You've celebrated great moments and coached amidst bad ones. You've taught subjects you've loved and you've taught some that you kind of had to learn along the way. When people talk about the next generation or investing in the future, you are the few who truly walk the walk. You're on the front lines. You get a peek into the window of what our world will look like 10, 15, 20 years down the road because you helped shape the people who those communities will be comprised of. There are not enough minutes, hours, days, or catchy phrases that I can say that would express our appreciation. And so I'll say it as plainly and as kindly and as directly as I can. On behalf of our staff, on behalf of our congregation, and most importantly, on behalf of our community, I say thank you. And what you have done has not gone unnoticed or unappreciated. And so if you are part of a school staff, I wanna invite you to stand up. Would you, would you stand up because we would love to celebrate you. If you are a teacher, school administrator, anyone, and let's give them a big hand. Uh, as, a, as a community, we also want to just show a little appreciation towards you, what we can. And so on your way out today, we have a gift uh, outside, of our, outside of our lobby in our courtyard. And you can, uh, you can pick that up on your way out and you'll see them uh, towards the front there. So let me pray for you and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. Heavenly Father, uh, I want to thank you for so many of these adults who say yes to caring for the next generation who say yes to caring for our students amidst what has been one of the craziest seasons to be involved in schools and caring for students. And so we're grateful for the faculty and staff who've shown up faithfully day in and day out, putting more hours and time than we know into caring for them. And I pray that today they would get that sense and that feel that you speaking to them saying, job well done. My prayer is they would feel cared for today, Father. And as we talk about the next generation, as we talk about this generation, I pray that you would show us as a church today how we can show up as a community, as a congregation, as a people for uh, the, our students and kids. 
We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're just joining us for the first time in a bit, we're in the middle of a series called Soapbox, uh, which is about uh, our pastors and passion pleas for things that we care about most. And uh, as we're on this topic of the next generation, I can't think of anyone more equipped to speak to you today about the next generation, about this generation, than our student pastor, Jake Ochoa. Jake is our most recent staff addition. He uh, joined us late in December, and he's already made such an impact in the lives of our students Uh, as well as our staff. In the short time I've gotten to know Jake, uh, I found him to be a man full of wisdom, someone who is incredibly patient, which is such a gift working in student ministries. (laughs) I've also found him to be someone who deeply cares about students. You know, we knew that in the interview process, but as we got to know him more, we found out he doesn't just say those things, he truly deeply cares about the spiritual well-being of the families and the kids and the students of Parkview. And along with Ray Kohlbacher, we've also found he and Ray comprise uh, two of the 12 White Sox fans here in Chicagoland area. (laughs) So if you would join me and welcome Jake to the stage. I'm gonna take the compliments and then I'm gonna just let the other one slide. And that's okay. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Jake Ochoa. Uh, like Josh said, I am the student pastor uh, here at Parkview. I've been here since December. Um, I came with my lovely family and my lovely wife, Ashlyn, and my two-year-old son, Mateo, who you've probably seen run around these halls. He owns this church now. It is his. I feel like it's Captain Phillips. Like, he's the captain now. Um, And so he runs around this place like crazy. We've loved being here. So thank you so much for inviting us into your family. Thank you so much for inviting us into your congregation. Um, We have loved to be a part of it. And one of the biggest reasons why I love being a part of it is the way that you guys as a congregation care for the community. Um, We've seen that play out in numerous events, and we've seen that play out in uh, numerous services, and so I am so grateful that I get to be here on a day that we honor the teachers and honor uh, school staff. I'm a little bit of a school staff. I'm that assistant to the assistant coach in Bolingbrook. I coach tennis. The first service snickered and laughed when Josh said that, and I didn't take too kindly to that. Um, but you guys did better. So either you listened online and you knew not to laugh or um, you guys are just my favorite. Um, But I love caring for teachers because my brothers are teachers. I have a lot of family that are teachers. I have an aunt. I have a sister-in-law. I have a cousin. I have a few aunts. Um, I probably missed someone and they're probably going to get mad at me if they hear this message and they notice that I didn't notice or talk about them. So I have two brothers. They're teachers. They're on the screen. And then there's one other brother. Uh, He is also a youth pastor like me. So we like to say two teachers, two preachers. Um, I don't know how that happened. My parents are here. You could ask them how they did that um, if you want to. Uh, My little brother, he's my favorite uh, job. Not my favorite brother. (laughs) Definitely not. No, just kidding. Um, I don't have a favorite brother, but his job is my favorite out of all of us. He is a kindergarten gym teacher. It's the best job in the world, right? He, 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 and he, and he doesn't just teach for one school. He teaches for the whole Manuka school district. So he just goes school to school teaching kindergarten gym class. So he gets like a break in between his tough job every day. Um, and so it's like amazing. He says like the first two weeks are just him teaching the kids how to tie their shoes. Um, he says if you, if they don't learn it in the first two weeks, the class is going to go off the wall from that point on. And so, um, you can tell my family is very passionate about serving the next generation. Um, and so am I, I'm passionate about serving the next generation. My family's passionate passionate about serving the next generation. And so um, when Andy asked uh, the pastors to speak about something they were passionate about, the next generation was the first thing that popped into my head. Generation uh, Z is the first thing that popped into my head. See, we're in this series called Soapbox where a different pastor gets to speak on a different topic they're passionate about, wrestling about, thinking about, and kind of get to make an impassionate plea 
And the thing I want to make an impassioned plea about today is Generation Z. And I believe that's because they're one of the most misunderstood generations of all time. You see, a lot of people believe that they are um, lazy, that they're addicted to their phones, they're self-entitled, the list goes on. However, I believe something completely different. I believe that they are driven, they're entrepreneurs, they're tech savvy, they're eco-friendly, and they're fighters for justice. I believe that they can rally around a good message and fight to further the cause using every resource around them. So when I think about the gospel, the greatest message ever told, and think about how they can use that, I just, I can't even imagine what they can do. Their ability to use constant messaging and communication as a catalyst for change in evangelism is an exciting thought to consider. And so I know that some of you guys know what I'm talking about when I talk about generations. Some of you guys, you're not as familiar. Maybe you know the big ones. You know the baby boomers. You know the millennials. Maybe you don't know what generation you are. Maybe you think you're one generation, um, but you're not really sure. A lot of researchers like to use concrete dates. They like to say millennials were born between 1985 and 2000. They like the big, bold numbers, the fives, the zeros, right? I don't like looking at, at at it in that way. I think that's odd because I believe that every generation is defined by a very specific event in history that changed their life and society around them. A generation isn't a country club where a board of directors gets to decide who gets to influence it. It's not a country club where a board of directors gets to decide who gets in. A generation, it is defined by a person or group experiencing the, the defining events of that generation. For an example, let's start with millennials. Do I have any millennials in here today? Okay, that's about what I thought would happen with millennials. <laughs> I'm a millennial, so I could talk bad about them. We are the forever hated millennials. Everyone hates us. I don't know why. I do know why, but... <laughs> but the, the biggest question I ask uh, when people are trying to decide, are they millennial or are they Gen Z? They're kind of on the cusp and they're trying, they've heard some dates. But the biggest question I ask is, do you remember September 11th? I'm not asking if they were born on September 11th. I'm not asking if they were born around September 11th. I'm asking, do you remember where you were and do you remember how society changed after that? I remember sitting in my fifth grade classroom during September 11th. I remember being picked up from school and then my life completely changing. High anxiety, high, high stress, high security all over the world. Society changed. I remember uh, society changing after a few other key events. Millennials came of age during a time of rapid technological emergence. Mobile phones, the internet, email, digital photos. They were influenced by the Columbine school shooting, Y2K, Facebook's birth, the Great Recession of 2008. Millennials are finally entering their wealth accumulation phase and starting families. This is later than ever before. This is why I can't buy a house right now because everyone's just throwing in offers that are just ridiculous. It's horrible. But they're starting later than ever before, including Gen X. Gen X is the forgotten generation is what I call them because everyone just forgets to mention them. They just jump right over them. Do we have any Gen X in here? Is it? Oh, oh, wow. Okay. I'm liking it. The question I ask is, do you remember the fall of the Berlin Wall? They came in the midst of skyrocketing divorce rates. They came at a time where both parents are working full-time jobs. They came of age during the birth of the personal computing and personal, personal technological devices like Atari. <laughs> I'm a millennial. I'm an N64 man myself. But Gen X also witnessed the start. <laughs> yeah, 64. <laughs> Gen X also witnessed the start of MTV. Particularly, they came in to the, particularly in the U.S., they came of age during the events, including the AIDS and the crack epidemic and in the energy crisis. Gen X is already taking over senior leadership roles in businesses, and that trend is only going to accelerate as soon as our baby boomers finally decide to retire. <laughs> For the baby boomer, my question is, do you remember the JFK assassination? 
that massive generation came of age in an aftermath of World War II. They weren't born during World War II. They came during a time of economic expansion, including the first suburbs. They came uh, during a time of massive social change uh, that, with key events like the Civil Rights Movement, Cold War, counterculture of the 1960s, the Vietnam War. Baby boomers are known for their work ethic and their work style, and they let you know it all the time. But they have an imp impact on a lot of leadership in organizations, and their generation as a whole will continue to have tremendous influence for years to come. You see, a generation isn't, or isn't defined by a regularly spaced gap of years. This isn't something that changes every 20 years or so. The rhythm of generation depends on the timing of historical, social, and cultural events that affect people's experiences. These events and changes to the rhythms of society influence the way a generation makes decision, decisions on such things as education, marriage, building a family, working years, their goals, their values. And the truth is, if we're defining generations by life-changing events, in today's social media world, world-changing events are happening every day. They're happening, ra happening rapidly. Everything is a world-changing event. And so, so much so that research think that there's going to come a time very soon where we're not going to be able to define generations because they're happening so frequently. The Barna Group, who has done a ton of research on Gen Z, calls our current culture digital Babylon. David Kinnaman says this, not too long ago, North America felt to many Christians like Jerusalem to the ancient Judeans. Culturally homogeneous, religiously comfortable but as cultural change has accelerated over the past three decades, many have begun to feel like exiles from their home country. Like the Hebrew exiles, many feel they are living in a very different place than the land of their tribe. So when we look at the book of Daniel, we see a group of believers whose view of the world has completely changed. Let's look there. If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to Daniel chapter 1. We'll look at uh, verses 1 through 7 today. It says this, in the year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Along with some of the articles from the temple of God, these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Balthazar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. See, Daniel and his friends, our young Hebrew men, are taken into captivity by the Babylonians. This is the same Daniel that eventually goes on to go into the lion's den. This is the same group of friends that eventually uh, face the fiery furnace for their beliefs. These are people on fire for God, but are no longer around anyone like them. They don't serve the same God as the people around them. They don't speak the same language. They eat different food. They are in a complete cultural shift. They went from a world with faith at the center to a world with faith as an afterthought. They went from one true God to a society that worshiped multiples. They went from a tension-filled city that, or they went to a tension-filled city that was nothing like their simple life prior. They went to a new, diverse, and open-minded environment. They had to look forward and learn how to practice a religion in a new society that made them uncomfortable. In a new world, a new society, looking ahead, they had to teach themselves not only how to teach themselves, but others how to worship God. Now think about this. Daniel and these three other guys are believed to be the ages of 14 and 21 years old. Essentially the same age as our current Gen Z essentially the same age as our middle schoolers, high schoolers, and a lot of our college students at Parkview. 
Gen Z is in a digital Babylon. Their journey is eerily similar to the journey of Daniel. Gen Z is part of a generation that is statistically only 4% Bible-believing. 4%. This means they are the first generation to be born post-Christian. They haven't walked away from God in their life. They've never had God in their lives. You see, baby boomers, church is where you went. Church is what you did. Gen X, church is probably what your parents dragged you to. Millennials, church is what you walked away from. And the odds are Gen Z has never even stepped foot in a church. Kinnaman continues with this. He says, it's possible that many churches are preparing young Christians to face a world that no longer exists. The society is as fast-paced as we have ever seen. Christianity is on the outskirts of society, and the dream that the church is the center of a community is far away. Are we making disciples for Jerusalem when we need to be making disciples for Babylon? Are we acting like God is the only thing being worshipped in our society? Are we acting like everyone has the same morals as us? Are we acting like everyone in this room has the same morals as us? Like Daniel, we are serving a God in a country that is stepping completely away from God. However, somehow, however, I still have hope in this next generation. I have hope in a generation that's been stripped of their identity in God. And that's because I've seen their strengths, I know their passions, and I feel their drive. I see it every day, and I want to share some of those with you today. I want to share a little bit about Gen Z. I want to take this myth that we have about Gen Z and bring in truth. You see, the first thing you'll probably notice about Gen Z is they are all in their feelings. Josh talked about mental health a few weeks ago. This group talks about it every single day. Gen Z explores their emotions and deals with them out loud to their communities. Nothing's hidden. They are more likely to seek counsel on their mental health than any previous generation before. One of the biggest reasons for their counseling need is their drive to succeed. Success is one of the highest priorities of Gen Z. In 2016, 2017, three quarters in the surveys, three quarters of Gen Z told researchers that finishing their education and starting a career were their highest priority. Follow that up with a study done in 2020 from the same group. Three quarters of Gen Z said that they have been successful so far, and 91% have said that they hope to achieve a great deal in the next 10 years. You may be thinking, well, duh, who doesn't want to achieve a great deal? But this survey has been done with other generations, and it's not the same results, especially millennials. <laughs> In my experience with Gen Z, this has played out numerous times. Students I've worked with are constantly looking for ways to further their, de their development. They're constantly looking for ways to put things on a resume, put things on an application. I've had students who have played college football. I've had students that have started their own businesses, that have launched their own podcast. I even had a student, 14 years old, star on Broadway. Having a job isn't enough. Having a hobby isn't enough. These students have a drive to succeed and move forward in life with their career. But with that drive comes high expectations. Expectations from their parents, expectations from their friends, and most importantly, themselves. 31% of students feel internally pressured and 25% feel externally pressured. In the survey, 41% feel at least one of those pressures. Internally, they are pressured to be successful and perfect. Externally, they are judged by older generations and feel the weight of their parent expectations. On top of that pressure, they are experiencing trauma all around them. The CDC estimates that 8 out of 10 Gen Z adults have experienced at least one traumatic experience, with that number climbing even higher in minority communities. These aren't little traumas either. These include the death of a loved one, suicidal thoughts, racial discrimination, domestic abuse, addiction, and many more. Trauma in their life is heavy. It's present. And although it's frequent, it comes out of nowhere. You can never be prepared for trauma. Then we add on top of that when they pick up their phone 
and see the trauma in the world. You see, some call this generation screenagers. Gen Z was raised with smart devices and smartphones. They don't know a world without it. I'm old enough where I, I remember a world without a smartphone. My grandma even had the phone where you just... <laughs> Boomers know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when I call my family... Right, when I call my family, when I call my brothers, when I call my, my dad, when I call my mom, um, my son runs to the phone. He wants to see his uncles. He wants to see his uh, papa. He wants to see uh, his nana. He, he wants to see the person he's talking to. He doesn't know a world where he can't see who he's talking to. They were born into these screen habits. They are self-aware of their screen habits. Common sense media determined the average time on the phone for ages 13 to 18 is seven and a half hours. That's a full working day on the phone. Gen Z would say that's about what they expect, and they would say that their generation, 60% of Gen Z would say that their generation spends too much time on their phone. So they know it. 83% use social media and spend at least two hours a day on social media. Now, I don't want to see any parents nudge their kids or look over because these stats are completely normal compared to other generations. They're exactly the same. Teen, but the thing is, teens are signing up for these accounts earlier than ever before. Using these apps, they feel informed, they feel connected to people, they feel connected to, around the world. Everything I've told you about generations so far has had a very American feel to it. And that's because uh, millennials, baby boomers, Gen X, a, a millennial, a baby boomer, Gen X in America is very different from one in Korea or Africa, right? But Gen Z is different. You see, Jason Dorsey says this, one of the least talked about things is geography. Previous generations, there are differences based on geography, differences between urban and rural, and differences as you travel around the world. The most consistent generation around the world is Gen Z, and that's because they live in a digital world rather than a social one. This is how they connect. This is where they live. This is where they meet up. This is where their relationships live. One of my favorite stats is teen pregnancies are way down low. That isn't because their morals have gone up. It's because they live in a digital world and not a physical one. I'll let you guys figure that one out for yourselves. You see, morals are a roller coaster for Gen Z. Things in their life are constantly changing. There seems to be two to three sides of everything with no middle ground. And because of COVID, they've been forced to wrestle with their morals and their faith internally by themselves. Gen Z's thoughts on morality are changing and they are valuing different opinions. 91% would agree that it's okay to disagree with the opinion of another or the point of view of another. With one exception, you can't oppose any other beliefs. That's interesting in today's world because everyone has an opinion. Everyone, uh, we live in a world where everyone has an agenda, a world where you can twist words and data to become more convincing for your side. Gen Z would say that they can't trust Hollywood, Wall Street, public education, or the U.S. government. Pretty same with a lot of generations. But in the last year, their trust in police and health officials have gone down in half. The people they do trust are their friends, of course. And then here's what I want you to listen to. The other people they trust are close friends and family of older generations. They feel they have their best interest in mind. They meet with them regularly, and they feel valued by older generations. So what about the church? The biggest thing I hear as a youth pastor is this generation is leaving the church in droves. Everyone likes to give me their little statistic that they saw on Facebook or the little meme they saw. I think back to a movie I saw a few months ago called Don't Look Up. Maybe some of you guys have seen it. Timothy Chalamet is sitting in a truck with Jennifer Lawrence as the world is about to end. If you don't know who those actor and actresses are, you're probably not Gen Z or a millennial. And they, Timothy says, I feel like if God wanted to destroy the earth, he would destroy the earth. Shocked but accepting, Jennifer Lawrence asks if he actually believes in God. And he says this line that has stuck with me. He says, yeah, I mean, my parents raised me evangelical and I hate them, but I found my own way to it, my own relationship. 
I'd appreciate it if you didn't advertise it, though. It's not something that Gen, feel, Gen Z feels comfortable showcasing to the world, but they are open to faith. They are open to wrestling with their faith. This generation is open to faith. They're open to a relationship with God. The thing they need, though, is a safe space that understands them, that values them, and a community that, trust, that they trust has their best interest in mind. So how do we become that place? How does Parkview become that place for our students? How did Daniel navigate through Babylon? We need to figure out the world around us. We need to embrace that the world is shifting. And as a church, we need to make sure that we are adapting constantly. We can't do ministry to the 15 to 21 years old, 21 year olds the same way we did it 20 years ago. It's not about changing them to be more like, like us. It's about noticing their strengths and encouraging them as they begin to lead the next generation of the church. So let's start with their mental health. Gen Z is open to sharing their mental health journeys. So let's give them a space of understanding and a place where they feel comfortable sharing. We need a place that's vulnerable. We need a place where students can share about their joys and their struggles, no matter how deep they are. And as a youth pastor, let me tell you, some of those struggles are deep, very deep. Let's manage their ambition. Let's show them how to, what it looks like to have success from a gospel point of view. Let's teach them how to rest. I love that Pastor Michael is on sabbatical. He's leading by example. He's taking a sabbatical in order to recharge, refuel, reconnect his heart. And we, need, we are showcasing as a church that it's okay to rest and reset and that everyone needs that. We must rest from work, pressure, social media, technology. Let's show Gen Z how to do that. Let's show how to put your phone down and spend time in prayer and meditation. There is no reason that us as an older generation should be having the same numbers as Gen Z when it comes to social media and screen time. We need to exemplify new ways of limiting our social media time, but most importantly, we need to exemplify coming together off of a screen, coming together physically, in person, in a physical world, focusing on discipleship. Following Jesus can be a challenge with Gen Z. However, I've said it since the day I got here, since the day Ray introduced me, I'm looking for each of my students to have a faith that is their own. Not mine, not Ray's, not the church, not their parents. A faith that is their own, and I think Gen Z is open to that. They're not actively searching it out, but they're open to it, and I will take that. The door is creaked open a little bit, and we as a church have a chance to further this kingdom. It starts with understanding their curiosity, and sometimes that's a scary place. My hope is that we as a church can be open to allowing kids to explore that curiosity. You can provide them advice, experiences, resources, but don't Bible thump them. Instead, give them a space to explore, space to make mistakes, a space that comes from trust. We need to be a church that our students can trust, a church that is there for them, that values their opinion and gives them trust. Part of that trust is letting them lead things. We need to let them lead worship. We need to let them lead our children. We need to let them lead small groups. We need to let them teach Trusting them with the generation to come. Most of my leaders, half of my leaders are Gen Z. We need to trust them to look to us for guidance when they need it. This generation is incredible. They're success driven. They're emotionally healthy. They're tech savvy. They're understanding of opinions and beliefs and they're open to a relationship with Christ. Can you imagine what that kind of generation can do for the kingdom of God? Every generation can bring something to the kingdom of God. And I believe that we need people in the kingdom of God. As a young high school student, I had a, high, uh, a youth pastor who saw leadership ability in me and my friends. He saw skills to, and abilities to further the kingdom of God. So we invested in our lives. He opened up his house every week for us to go and share our struggles, our joys, he encouraged us to use the newly discovered social media, Facebook, MySpace, 
and reach out to people, use it to help build community. He let us lead. He let us lead small groups. We had some guidance from some older generations, but we were the leaders of the small groups. He pushed me to lead outside of the church. And because of him, I've been able to influence this next generation. He believed in the next generation, and so do I. Parkview, I promise you, if you believe in them, they will do things for the kingdom we can't even begin to imagine. They are not the generation of tomorrow. They are the generation of right now. We need to create space for them to explore, to build trust, and give them leadership opportunities. And most importantly, we need to lead by example. Today, I want to give you guys a tangible way to invest in the next generation. It doesn't cost any money. It doesn't uh, cost anything. But we have a few different responses you can take home today. First, I'm going to do a shameless plug. I could always use leaders in the student ministry. So if that's something you want to do, you come talk to me. I'd love to talk to you about that. The second thing, you probably saw it in the lobby. We're starting a program today called Adopt a Student. No one's going to take home a student today. It's not anything like that. But we have cards in there, up there, and they have all of our high schoolers' contact info, their favorite snack, their birthday, maybe what they're looking forward to for the new year. And we're asking that if, if you are willing that you would take one of those cards and you would invest in them for this next year. That means praying for them, encouraging them, maybe sending them a gift card or two. Just a simple way of saying that we see that you are here, you are a part of our church, and we believe in you. If you can't commit to a full year of that, then we also have these smaller cards. These are our middle schoolers, probably a totally different generation than Gen Z. And we just ask that you would take one of those cards and commit to praying for them for this next year. These are our students. These are, they are a part of our church. One of the biggest reasons why millennials were leaving the church was because they were a part of the youth group and they weren't a part of the church. Our kids are a part of Parkview. They're not a part of my student ministry. They're a part of Parkview as a whole. And we need to invest in them in that way. Before I close today, I want to speak to Gen Z directly. There's a few of them in this room. Do you guys understand what the Babylonians were trying to change? They're trying to train them to serve the king. They're trying to strip them of their identity. They want their identity to be rooted not in God, but a worldly king. This digital Babylon is trying to do the same thing to you. It's trying to rob your generation of the 4% that is left in the identity of Christ. In the book of Daniel, they use fear. They use God's gold statues. They use food to try and sway away the Hebrews from God. Today, they use influencers, pop culture, music, fashion, and they gather your attention to a point where you're not robbed from your identity. You simply walk away from it. Yet I feel hope because what the enemy uses for evil, God can use for his glory. And with this generation, that's truer than ever before. The devil wants you to get addicted to social media. He wants to get you consumed, anxious, depressed, anything to keep you from wanting to be yourself and anything to keep you from your eyes away from God. God's plan is greater for you and this next generation. What the devil uses to suck you in, God can use you to become the greatest digital missionaries of all time. What the devil uses to bury you in depression, God can use you to break down the stigma in the church that everything is fine and okay and healthy. God can use you now. Your now will always lead your next. And what you do now to fortify your faith will lead you in your next. And this is huge because you're going to lead the next. Church, our generations are different. Our experiences, our journeys are different. But let's not let our differences drive us apart. 
Instead, let us lean into curiosity to learn from one another and encourage each other on. Today, I'd love to make you a little bit uncomfortable. I'd love to lead from Carlos's example. I'd love you guys to stand today for a second. I'd love you to look around, around you, find someone of a different generation and just ask them their name. I hope you found someone. Remember their name, because today, today I want us to pray for each generation. I want us to pray for the teachers that teach this generation. I want to pray for the parents that parent the next generation. And I want to pray for all the other generations too. I want to push you guys a little bit. I come from a little bit of a charismatic background, so I'm going to push you a little bit. I want you to pray out loud for the whoever you just learned their name. As I pray, I want you to pray for that person. I want you to pray for that generation. If they're a teacher, pray for their next school year. If they're a parent, pray for this summer when they're home all day with their children. If they're a student, pray for their future. Let's pray. Lord, we lift up this generation to you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to give these students purpose. We ask you, Lord, to build a community in this church that fosters friendships, that fosters relationships, Lord. We pray for the character of the next generation, that they would be grounded in you, Lord. That they would be grounded in your love, we pray that their identity would be found in you, Lord, and nothing else, Lord. We pray that their idea of success would not be in the money that they earn, but the value that they bring, the value that they bring to their church, the value that they bring to their schools, to their communities, Lord. We call them, Lord, to submit to you. We call them to honor you. We ask you, Lord, to grow this next generation. We put our hope in you, Lord, for this generation. Lord, the parents and teachers, we lift them up, Lord. We ask that you give them hope. I ask that you transfer my hope into, into them, Lord. Give them passion. Give them patience. Lord, give them patience. Give them leadership. Give them compassion. Lord, we pray over this congregation, generation to generation. Give us discernment and guidance as we lead generations of your church to come. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I will be here um, after service. I, I could talk about generations for the next two hours or until the White Sox start. I don't know what time. Just kidding. But we thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Teachers, make sure you get your gifts. Um, and then any high school students, we'd love to see you tonight at 530. Let's pray um, one more time, and then you guys are dismissed. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for just allowing this congregation to come together and worship you, Lord. We pray for every generation that is here, Lord. We pray that you would just lead them and guide them today, tomorrow, and in the future. Lord, we thank you again for this beautiful day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.